Good morning to you all. <coughs> we'll start with the anthem Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, it was Whitson Sunday, last Sunday. So in the uh, CME Christian calendar, this week is Trinity Sunday, where we think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity, a further opportunity to come and Praise you, God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We might not always understand how all things, how all three characters work, or how they all work together. In some ways, <coughs> beyond our comprehension. God, in three persons, blessed Trinity. We thank you for all that each role, as it were, does for us. And the Father wants to be reconciled, us to be reconciled back to Him. How Christ Jesus was that means, dying for sin in our place, that we might no forgiveness, and how that God can live in us, guide us day by day through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this, Heavenly Father. Oh, God. Yes, we thank you for today, for the, the sunshine, the cheering of our, our, our inner spirits as we often say you see things grow, things bloom, things flowering. It reminds us of you, our creator. And yes, we are your creatures and you deserve our praise. May we give you our praise this morning. Okay, be with the boys and girls as all say are in Jan and as they uh, learn the lessons there. We thank you for your love to us, Heavenly Father, manifested in so many ways. We thank you for your faithfulness. <coughs> we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's sing this hymn. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. There's a lot of repetition in these three verses, so uh, we'll get the idea in here.
This will continue to hold. Some we haven't seen for a while, and some uh, who we have. Good to see you all. I had a phone call from Daphne yesterday. Not, not too long, I guess some of the others had a longer conversation. But uh, she sends her, her love. She says she is uh, too frail, really, to uh, come out on Sundays. And she did sound a bit frail in her voice, but uh, it was still the old Daphne there. I think somebody had left some flowers on her doorstep last Sunday, and she wondered if it was me. It wasn't. I had it or whether it was somebody else in the church, but uh, uh, no one signed up yet, so uh, uh, she appreciated them. As you can see, it's myself this morning. Then this afternoon at 4 30, we're here for Jubilee Church Anniversary Afternoon Tea. 4 30. All welcome. And then at 6 pm, it will be, we're expecting Bob Warwick to be here. Tuesday, 7 30, prayer and Bible study. Wednesday, 6 pm, Boys Club and 7 30, Youth Club. Friday, 6 30 pm, Girls to Go. The next Sunday, the 19th of June, yeah, we expect, well, expecting 10.30 Roger to lead the service and communion will be part of the service the general Bible class and in the evening 6 p.m. it's um, a video from Midfield Evangelical Church Streets to pray for this week Broth and Close Chapel Lane and Common Road UEC Church for Remembering Prayer is the one at Whitford. And the missionary focus this week is the Bible Society. So pick up the prayer letter and it tells you all about it, as they say. Just a couple of other notices. There is a UEC Men's Breakfast due next week, or next Saturday, at South End Evangelical Church, if you know where that is. And they put the times back to 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I think it's Simon Pinchbeck who's, who's, uh, who's the speaker there. Just a group, well, I don't think I've told you this, but there's a special service at the old Rayleigh Church on Friday the 1st of July. In one sense it's to say goodbye to the church, but it does say on here another door opens. There's some flyers at the back, so as I said previously, take one and read all about it. There's also, I have another flyer in the week, but I won't say much about it, but there is a, a Women's Day conference, but it's in October in Eastwood. And I'll bring the flies another week. And just to say that, as I think I mentioned, in June and July, the missionary what money is collected in the missionary box at the back are going to the Gretchmans in Uruguay. Thank you. Let's sing again. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew. That I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do.
we know there are names for months past. <coughs> as we say, need an interest in our prayers and your assistance from the Father. We heard of an update on a person in America. Sorry, I forgot the name that Angela shared, but again, for the news there, of that situation there, we thank you for answers today, Heavenly Father. You know, there are others on our minds, other situations, other peoples who are in need. As we say, if it's that we should <coughs> assist in, the, in their needs, then give us that mind to assist. If it's something that we just cannot do, we ask for a miracle, Heavenly Father. Or well, that your will is done in those people's lives. We mean that sincerely as we know, as we have said, these people were brought to Jesus and Jesus had compassion on them and healed them. Lord, help us to continue to preach the gospel, to deal with as it were, men's souls. Help us to preach the truth, preach the salvation gospel, we would pray. Help us in that, Heavenly Father. Help those throughout this land and throughout the world who are doing just that every day. We think of the societies that we do support with monetary gifts and with prayers. We think of the leprosy society that we have mentioned. Jeremy Nash and Mission Africa. Tim and Susanna Gretchen. London City Mission. And even the work of the Bible Society. Taking the Bibles to various places. And your word speaks to men's hearts and saves them. We thank you for this, Heavenly Father. We still are minded of the war in Ukraine. We sometimes don't know how to pray. But Lord, when it is intense on our hearts, Though we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. It puts a voice to our inner thoughts. Lord, we would pray for peace, Heavenly Father. We don't like men's hatred against men. Lord, remember that country, that situation. It's having such an effect on the whole world. We think of food crises and perhaps Lord if there's something we can need to do with, with that, provide gifts to food banks, then may we be minded to do that. Lord, we do thank you for the church here. You know we're going to have a little time fellowship together with pre tea this afternoon and to enjoy that but may we again remember why the church is here it's because of you may we understand that and may this church continue to bear witness in this village with the with the old with the young sharing your gospel we ask this in jesus name amen I'm going to sing a couple of chorus type songs now. Jesus, you are changing me.
you uh, remember the reading. But what can we see in these three incidents we read about? Saying that, you might think I should be giving the tree ties on, on the Trinity. As I've mentioned it, yeah, as it is um, in the church calendar today's Trinity Sunday. Or you might have thought that today's theme would be God the Holy Spirit, with last week being Whitson, but all our focus perhaps more put on to the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. Now it was interesting to look through and read that booklet that we, uh, some of us had on uh, about the Queen's coronation and the preparation for her coronation, how she was well guided by the Holy Spirit through the extracts and principles of the scriptures and prayers put together by the then Archbishop of the service, the duty, the significance of the ordination and anointing that would be before her uh, in her whole life, uh, in her whole life, yeah, even up to this day. Well, we did hear, didn't we? Jesus defend the Holy Spirit. So, so it's part. So it is part of the message. But what is concerned, not to talk about the Holy Spirit wrongly or falsely. As you know, I've been going through Mark, uh, Mark's Gospel, and uh, I don't really want to overlook any passage or any verses that you said for a focus or theme. We didn't read some verses, did we there? Verses 13 to 19, as we have considered them previously. If I remember rightly, it was about reputation, focusing, or as a start, on James and John being given the names Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, as if they had a bit of a temper or something like that. I don't know. But I'm sure the Spirit moulded them and changed them. But as I looked at this, and have been thinking, I came up with this question, how do you see Jesus? So let me ask you that today. We have the whole picture, of course, the whole story to reflect on, hindsight. We have Jesus explained by himself, by the apostles, notably Paul and Peter, plus others. Jesus should influence our whole life and being. But then, it was then and now, the events were unfolding before people's eyes. People's views over time would have changed, or could have changed. I don't know if you've ever thought on this. There were those at the cross who passed by and ridiculed and shouted abuse at Jesus there. He saved others. Himself he could not save. Perhaps, as time allowed, they considered what had happened at that time. Why Jesus Christ died. He did save from sin. And perhaps, as they considered this and the Holy Spirit worked on them, he became their Saviour, or he became their Saviour and Lord. If we ask people today who Jesus was, we would get a multitude of answers. If we ask people what they knew about his life, we would again get a multitude of answers. But if we ask whether Jesus made any influence on their lives, we would probably get blank looks, as if what are we talking about? So how did the people then see Jesus? I don't like to put it like this, and it's an understandable people's immediate reaction. 
But did people come to Jesus to get something out of him rather than for who he really is? I.e. not for his message. His message that was the words of eternal life. What do I mean? Jesus was now famous. I don't think we can get away from that. His fame went before him. He was in Galilee. The people came from north, east, south and west to find and see him. Yes, they came from far and wide parts of all over the country. Judea, Jerusalem, Euthymia, the other side of the Jordan, and Tyrant's side. And a more detailed map, I could point them out, couldn't I? And you could see where they all were. I know I do them any justice. Jesus was their only answer. He could help them in their situation. But was that it? They came to be healed of their diseases, and they were. It changed their lives physically, but we would ask, were they reconciled to the Father, God the Father, long term? We think of risk assessments as a modern day consideration. But did you see Jesus carry out a risk assessment? He knew there would be a crowd with a risk of a crush. Personal safety was at risk for himself and people of the crowd. What mitigation or action did he take? He asked his disciples to have a boat ready so he could be in the boat at a safe distance from the crowd on the shore. Did Jesus have a lasting influence on them? Jesus wanted to change their lives and then to repent and return to God. Does Jesus have a lasting influence on you? What of his family, his mother and brothers? How did they see Jesus? At this time, were their eyes blinded to who Jesus was? Were they too close? Being family? Blinkered? Didn't, perhaps they didn't get the bigger picture. So do we individually keep Jesus to ourselves? Again, we can understand his family's concerns. We wouldn't have done anything differently, probably, in the circumstances. It would seem they were concerned about Jesus' health, both physical and even his mental health. They wanted to take him out of the hectic, pressure situation as they saw it. Another crowd, we read down in me, this time in the house, so much so that the meal wasn't possible. Jesus' family found out and went to find him with the plan to take him away from that situation, away from the stress, getting somewhere quiet and give him a meal and space. We know what Jesus means to us, as it were, in our own our, in our family setup. So do we try and keep him? within our family constraints or our views as it were are we is it blinkered do we overlook perhaps how others how others need to see jesus we try and tell them how they should see jesus as we would say they need to see jesus sorry if i'm losing you there but uh, with my train of thoughts are we too technical at time? Are we too theoretical at times? Are we too impractical at times? Is there a bigger picture? 
have we got to let other people to see and thus find Jesus themselves, knowing that the Holy Spirit will convict people of sin and convince them that Jesus is the remedy. Now don't get me wrong, the gospel needs to be preached, we must not stop preaching it. But are we change or not change again? Get, getting in the way, or as I've written here, but are we not assisting in opening people's eyes and ears to Jesus, as it were even taking Jesus away from them? Do we let them have simple faith to believe, not complicated faith? Dare I say, with animals? Now I don't think we do, but perhaps we should be careful at times. We've looked at the public, we've looked at the family, and we would look at those who got Jesus totally wrong. But there were some who knew exactly who Jesus was and is, or perhaps on face values terms. Who was it? The demons of the demon possessed. What did it say? Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. That's how they saw Jesus. They knew who he was, who he really was and is. They knew what it meant. They knew how to react in reverence and fear. Reflecting at this and us, does familiarity breed contempt, as the saying goes? I have to be careful what I say, as others may have a different opinion. It would appear that demon possession was quite prolific in that day, and it would be wrong to confuse mental health today with demon possession then. I know we didn't read it, but when Jesus called to him the twelve, the twelve he wanted, it says he appointed them apostles, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons, suggesting with this latter role that there was a great need for this then. Jesus is the Son of God, part of the Godhead, who came and did his Father's will while here on earth, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the day when the Father will say, Return. I know there's more, more to it than that, but I've summarised it like that. Do we truly acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God with reverence and fear? Would we instantly fall to our knees or have to be reminded? Is Jesus so familiar to us that we have lost sight of who he really is? Well, we do have the Holy Spirit to remind us and show us, to reveal to us who Jesus is. We will come across people who have it totally wrong about Jesus. Some with ignorant misconceptions, some with deliberate misconceptions. There is a spiritual war. Satan is a bad loser, so disrupts, disputes and disarms. In my studies I came across this. Satan blinds the eyes of faith and seals up the lips of, of prayer. He puts up a smoke screen and sprays doubt. Jesus' popularity and teaching upset the so-called established religious leaders of the day. 
these people who Jesus would describe who uh, sought the praise of men rather than the praise of God or sought, didn't seek to really praise God. We read, didn't we, that they sent teachers of the law from Jerusalem to counteract, up to Galilee, to counteract what Jesus was saying and doing. You've got it, they came and spread fake news. Jesus is driving out demons, they said, because he himself is possessed by the prince of demons, Beelzebub. In other words, it's not God sent, it's not God's power or authority he's driving out demons. You've got Jesus wrong. He's not got God's spirit, he's got an evil spirit. And we read there how Jesus had to explain their argument as being totally ridiculous. And it ends with an eternal warning. Be careful in that, be very careful what you say. Because what you say expresses your heart. Never attribute to Satan the work, role, status, leading of the Holy Spirit. The Christian has to take heed. Satan comes and reminds us of our sinful nation, nature. He encourages our sinful nature. But the Christian should be controlled by the Spirit for the positive. Elsewhere in the Bible you have this theme, this truth, which no doubt you have experienced or seen for yourself. That saying, by their fruits you shall know them. You get the example of trees. A bad tree produces bad fruit. The tree is corrupt. A good tree produces good fruit. Look at Ephesians 4 and 5 or Colossians 3. For examples of each, the contrasts of each, the bad versus the good. Or again, Galatians 5 lists the fruit of the Spirit. Is that Spirit seen in us? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He goes on to say, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. But be on the watch, lest we be tempted, lest we pretend, lest we become weary of doing good. We come across the Elzebub in the Old Testament. And, uh, and the lesson for us there is found in 2 Kings 1. I won't go into all the details, but the king of Israel at the time was King Ahaziah. And he had a life or death question. <coughs> He sought answer by sending his representatives, not to Elijah, but to the neighbouring country, so they could so consult their god, Baalzebub. Thus, by doing so, the king was saying in his heart, there was no god in Israel who could be consulted. Do we live by the Spirit? Or are or do we take our lead from someone or something else? We ask the question, how do you see Jesus? Perhaps the real question is how does Jesus see you? We read, then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brother. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 
When God made the world, what did he say? And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. That is the underlying, ever being intention, characteristic of God. What is God's will for us, put simply, that we become Christ-like, that we become God-like, his living image, in that he both is good and does good. So Christian, while the Holy Spirit, who promotes God, lives in every Christian, we ask ourselves, do we live continually under the influence and control of the Spirit? Do we out of love yield completely to the Holy Spirit to direct our lives? So it's an ongoing experience. Reflect on this. He is there to help, to comfort, to counsel, and if need be, convict and convince. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the grace, peace and blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain with us now and for always. Amen. Oh,